Major support for these broadcasts is provided by the CUNY TV Foundation, New York Community Bank, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Capital One Bank, Perfect Building Maintenance, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Genova Burns, G. and Tomasi and Webster, M&T Bank, The Wickoff Group, Chelsea Lighting, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional support is provided by Ackman Ziff Real Estate, AKA Hotels, Corman Communities, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Leumi, USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Colliers International, NYC, Cushman and Wakefield, DDG, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Union Funding, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Herrick Feinstein LLP, Hersha Hospitality Trust, Investors Bank, New Banks, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, James Orfanides Centurion Holdings, John Katsimatidis Red Apple Group, Margolin Weiner and Evans, Madison Realty Capital, Meridian Capital Group, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, People's United Bank, Popular Community Bank, SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling, Stonehenge Partners, Urban American, and these friends. It's the home of the Brooklyn Nets. It's the home of everything, and everybody wants to live, work, shop, spend money in Brooklyn. So today I've assembled this group of distinguished individuals to talk about what's happening in Brooklyn. My guests today include Ofa Cohn, who's the president and CEO of Tira, CRG. Toby Moskovitz, who is the president and CEO of Heritage Investments. Uh, Chris Conlin, who is the COO and EVP of Arcadia Realty Trust. And last but not least, we have the Chamber of Commerce president and CEO, Carlos Sassura. I got it even you right. got it right. Okay. So why does everybody want Brooklyn? Come on. There's, look, there's no other place in America that anyone should be. Period. Brooklyn, Being a Brooklyn boy, <laughs> Brooklyn, I feel the same way. I feel the same way. The interesting thing is I'm I a rarity. You, I hope you grew up in Brooklyn. I grew up born and raised oh, in okay. Brooklyn. I'm a rarity. Can you hear his accent? I am a rarity. Most <laughs> young people under 30 that flock and run and want to live in Brooklyn. I'm happy to say because you're not under 30. That's, I'm definitely not under 30, but the under 30 crowd that's moving to Brooklyn, one of the fastest growing demographics in the city of New York is not from New York, is from the Midwest and the South and California and China and everywhere, and they want to live in Brooklyn because it is the coolest, hippest, hottest place. You can do everything in Brooklyn. You can live, work, eat, shop, Enjoy yourself, go to the beach, hang out on the in Williamsburg and Red Hook, wherever. But, you know, Everything well, happens let's in Brooklyn. Understand, you know, Williamsburg, uh, eight years ago, nine years ago, you would go to Williamsburg and you could go over there and you'd find needles around there or you find oil. I mean, but look what's happening. Tell me what you're doing in Williamsburg. You're like the queen of Williamsburg. You're building all over Williamsburg. Just, I mean, just, the L train, the M train, this is. We just try not to screw it up. We, you know, I think, you know, to Carlo's point, you know, the, I spoke in, a, spoke in a panel yesterday and someone said, you know, how did the downturn affect Williamsburg? I think it helped preserve it, it in the authentic way in which it is, which is there's a real neighborhood there, real people are living there, artists moved in, young people are moving in, a lot of local but developers. You know what? People can't even afford to live in Williamsburg. <laughs> That's, mm. I, I mean, I. But it's it, okay. They move south. They go to Bushwick. We just had this conversation. They go to Sunset Park. Yeah. They go to Bay Ridge. They go to Greenwood Heights. They go to the, the R train corridor from Union Square to downtown to Park now, Slope now, to you know Sunset what? Park. You know, Chris has an interesting conglomeration of sites. He has probably one of the best sites in downtown Brooklyn, City Point, okay, where he's building this major retail complex and the residential towers on that. Then he's on Nostrand Avenue, which is an area which has seen ups and downs, but it's a great location, and another great development site in Sheepshead Bay, and you had one in Canarsie, but you sold that. Why do you 
and your company being a REIT and being a fund like Brooklyn so much? So it's, um, it's somewhat statistical, right? So it, across the country, there's about 55 square feet of retail per capita, okay? That's a national statistic. In Brooklyn, it's 23. So it's hugely under retail. So I almost interrupted you a moment ago where you could live, you, you can play, interrupt you can Don't shop. Worry. And I said, you can't shop in Brooklyn. You can kind no, of no, shop, no. but what you can't, what, what we hear time and time again, and the folks that we speak to and the retailers that we talk to, is that the, for, for Brooklyn residents, the newer Brooklyn residents in the last, let's call it 10 years, for them to find the best shopping options, they still need to go back into Manhattan. That's frustrating to them. That's why we are building into that demand in what we think is the best part of Brooklyn for what we can produce in downtown Brooklyn. Downtown Brooklyn is sort of this geographic center, all these great neighborhoods around it. The, the median home value of the neighborhoods around it is between 800,000 and two and a half million. And you but guys so know this. So those people have so no place to shop. So what downtown Brooklyn has become is really truly the hub of, down, of Brooklyn. I believe and, so. Okay, and from there, you know, <clears throat> you go to Williamsburg. From there, you, you go to Sunset. If you look at a subway map, it is, it, it's truly the confluence of subway lines, subway stations, and bus lines. Through downtown Brooklyn produces 44 million riders a year. The, uh, that confluence of stations and traffic. If you look at that map, and we have it in all our presentation materials, we're at the middle of it. Right? City Point and downtown yeah, Brooklyn are right so, at the middle. So as, as one of the leading investment salespeople in, in Brooklyn, where, where's the, the, where are people, you know, where are the foreigners, where are the investors coming from, and where do they want to be in Brooklyn? Well, just to, uh, to continue what Chris was talking about, the, the Barclays Center really, and really the, the combination of City Point and Barclays Center kind of unified that downtown Brooklyn experience. And if you walk now, you, have a, you can shop or you will be able to shop very soon uh, on Fulton Mall and you can go to a show and you can see a, a basketball game. That really made it, or it, it's, it's really feel, starting to feel like that 24 seven community that everybody wanted to, to make it. And uh, there's another 3,500. Okay, but uh, what's going to make it a true 24 uh, seven? We, we have right now, we have hotels we have more restaurants each each and every more month. More restaurants or, are needed. Uh, I think more restaurants we need are, a lot more restaurants. There's a huge shortage of restaurants. There's a huge shortage of, of, of proper grocery stores right. or state of the I shouldn't say proper state of the art grocery stores. Um, there are more hotels needed and there's shopping needed. You know, the spine of Brooklyn in terms of retail has always been Fulton Street for 170 years. There's been department stores, but the transformation of, of Fulton Street that we see or that we know about but you don't necessarily see. So you went to Brooklyn and you went to Fulton Street to, uh, three or four or five years ago and it was you know, some interesting local shops, most of which Ten sold cell phones ago, and t-shirts. Fulton Street, you could have compared it to basically Harlem and Jamaica in okay. certain aspects because you had local merchants, you really didn't have any national chains. Or, 30, HMV, or 34 Street, 50, 50, 50, 50, I, 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 I think what probably. Fulton Street becomes today is the better option of the 34th Street. I agree. It's a better walking place. Uh, it's not as big. No, because it's, it's more residential it's more around it's it, too. It's more of a shopping It's a shopping It's a shopping, mall. it's an sh outdoor shopping right. mall. And you're getting the way great it, tenants. Right. So it's, what you don't see yet is Sephora, Nordstrom Rack, TJ Maxx. And they'll be up in um, up two Banana years. Banana Republic factory store, right behind the Gap factory store, which is doubling in size right now. Swarovski, Armani Exchange has just opened. Um, Century 21, Alamo Draft House, and a soon to be named third anchor coming to downtown Brooklyn at City Point. They're all signed and they're coming, but the transformation is happening as we speak. So right. we're building into that and it feels really good because Toby, we're meeting that demand. You know, Toby, you, you, you're in Brooklyn, in, mostly in Williamsburg, and you've seen that, and you were saying just prior to this, you're even, there's a, there's a lack of, and I, and I was a little surprised from the comment, there's a lack of quality office space available in, in Brooklyn in general, and people want, you know, people like to live and work, and that's why Midtown South is doing so well with a vacancy of 1.6%, because there's no, not enough office. So what are you planning to do in, in Williamsburg? So, you know, I've been developing actively in Williamsburg starting in 2008 through the downturn, um, and started to happen about a couple of years back as our tenants started to call ask, asking us if we had available office space. Um, I own a small piece on North 6. We have a gaming company in a walk-up, and that's been the stock of, we'll call it, offices available to date. Um, so about six months back, we closed on the purchase of a full square block right near the White Hotel, which has now become a real destination, um, an entertainment district. 
Amazon is shortly going to be our neighbor. They're Amazon's right opening up the office or a distribution center? Um, as it's been explained in the, in the press, and Carlo can, yep. can weigh in, it's a combination of a photo studio and offices. And it's about 300, when you go to, 300, 350 employees will be going to that Amazon every day to work. It's a that's big, great. it's a big, that becomes all of a sudden one of Brooklyn's largest companies. And talking about the 24 7 communities, the combination of places to work, now we have places to play. <clears throat> Uh, no, I, 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 I was. I, I happened to be. Uh, was at an event for the Dime Savings Bank of Brooklyn, at Gando's yep. uh, about mm -hmm. a week and a half ago, and then we were riding a little bit. At, it was probably 8:30 at night, mm -hmm. and you're riding down Kent Avenue, you're riding down North 12th Street. I mean, it's vibrant. People are, are, are outside. In the last 24 I mean, months, you, you went know, from yeah. It's and wait, from wait till with, your yeah. project is done. Wait till Domino. I mean, look, Domino is going to be a transformative. Not just Brooklyn, but a transformative New York City. But to your project. question about the the office, it's you know I, I saw a statistic somewhere that 60 percent of Google employees live in and around North Brooklyn. <laughs> There's a very heavy concentration. When you a landlord, you get to see people's financials. Very very heavy concentration of tech company employees, which feeds into the discussion about Brooklyn in general. These are you know urban you know people who love living in an urban area very sophisticated, they like the restaurants, the food in the neighborhood, so we and they see, want to work locally. So do we see, you know, mm. I think Ofer and I had this discussion the other day, and I had it with a, uh, a developer who was thinking, in downtown Brooklyn, we had some, we have a lot of residential rentals, and at one time, I still remember, I was shocked when I said on my show, how were we going to absorb 2,300 units, and they were absorbed overnight and Avalon is getting a high price and everyone else and now we have There's stalls three properties and three right. major ones over there. So so he, here is here is my comment. What we don't have is we really don't have enough condos in downtown Brooklyn. There is no condo true condo development being built in downtown Brooklyn today. Right. We have twelve thousand residential units in the pipeline right now. Ninety five to ninety eight percent of them are, are rentals. Stay tuned. Right, right. You know, but the, the, two, the two towers that are being built on top of your platform, they're, they're both rentals. They are, but stay tuned. I think that, I think that a lot of the condo uh, activity is still pretty badly scarred from what we went through in the global financial mm -hmm. crisis. And as residential development picks up in, in New York, all the boroughs in, in particular, by the way, but, but in, in Brooklyn, uh, you'll see some more condos coming in. But, but that, you know, I think, they, I think land a price prices, yeah, I think right. the issue to date has been, for example, there was a building on North 6th where the owners essentially canceled condo contracts to ultimately sell it as a stabilized rental building because you were making more money on a sale. Well, other, as land prices go up, though, I think you're going to be forced to go then, back into condo development. But here is the interesting thing, and you see it, and you know, all, all of you see that. I remember land prices in Brooklyn, you know, they were $80 <laughs> a foot. Now we're talking about land prices in downtown Brooklyn were probably over $200 a mm -hmm. foot. But Williamsburg were close to two fifty dollars a foot. Oh, over, over. Over, over loves that. to tell people, and I'm going to have you tell it, how much are prices on Flatbush Avenue, forget about downtown Brooklyn, going up Flatbush Avenue towards Grand Army Plaza. How much are they going for now? The land? Yeah. You know, we've seen... And rentals. What, what's, it's, it's interesting. So land prices basically doubled in the last 18 months. The 80, 90 bucks a foot that you could have gobbled up properties during the recession, 2009, 2010, they were the, these were the prices. I mean, there were parcels in Williamsburg that were trading for 90 to 110, 120. And Toby was one of the people that, uh, Toby and her partner were one of the people that took advantage of it. Now we're literally double. So downtown Brooklyn, uh, you know, and let's call it Park Slope and down, greater downtown Brooklyn, 220 to 250. Williamsburg, North Williamsburg, you can't touch anything under 300, right? Um, you know, bear in mind too, getting back to the condo, uh, the condo idea is that the, the average age of the residents in the Avalon buildings, in, in, in the other rental buildings that were built right around our site in downtown Brooklyn is 26 years old, okay? So they might, there might be three or four people related or otherwise in those units, but it's a young community a young community starving for some level of authentic but, but, urban but, 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 living but, but, that they know, can find only in but Brooklyn. But you bring up a point, and I did this a number of years ago. I did a show on Jersey City, and I had uh, Jamie Lefrak on. And at that time, th the problem with Jersey City was the schools. The, you know, you, you need good schools 
okay, you know, when you're a young urban professional, a, a millennium Y, as we would call them, <laughs> you know, at that certain point, they don't have kids really over there. And the, as you, if you just alluded, you know, the, the, the age of the people in the Avalon properties are 26 to 29, so they don't have a family. If you're going to build up the family, it's gonna then, come. then you're going to need more <clears throat> schools. Right, and I think, I think you know, they're, in September, they're opening a great new public school on 4th Avenue around Butler Street, that's mm -hmm. gonna be great. Uh, I would bet a lot of money that within four or five years, you will see a brand new K-8 school built right around downtown Brooklyn. Um, in Brooklyn Heights, one of the schools just expanded uh, into eighth grade, PS8. Um, you've got uh, the new project that Two Trees is building in Dumbo. It's gonna have a full-scale middle school. So. People are thinking about that. We, we I, were I approached. Think that's important. We were yeah. approached at City Point as to if we could accommodate a 120,000 square foot school, and we were fully designed at that point, and unfortunately we couldn't provide that. But the demand's there, and, right. and, the and it'll be built. So, so now here's so we, we know about shopping, we know about living, staying. You know, I still believe there is a certain niche of of parts of Brooklyn that need. Hotels. I think Williamsburg definitely needs it. I'm not certain if there's a hotel need in, in Coney Island. But there maybe, should be. Okay, maybe in time, you know, because, you, you know, it's like I remember when the, the guy who happened to be in my show built in Long Beach the, this luxury hotel, and basically in the winter he had nobody over there, and he was lucky to get the people from the airport at $90 a square, you know, a night. So you, you have to have, you know, the economics of scale to, to live with that situation. Where is the opportunity, because right now there's not much land in downtown Brooklyn that you can buy. Williamsburg is being, being acquired over there. Is it Bushwick? Uh, is it, do you see Bed-Stuy? Do we, do we ever see East New York? I mean, how far Look, are we I from think, years from that? I Gowanus, Gowanus, uh, the next administration, I imagine, will focus on the Gowanus neighborhood because it's, it's fascinating, it's growing, a lot of hotels being built there. Uh, a lot of the Williamsburg scene is now moving to Gowanus because as Williamsburg becomes a little more upscale and the 26-year-olds yep. turn into the 40-year-olds in Williamsburg. So we're saying Gowanus, Gowanus. and Sunset Park? Uh, yeah, Gowanus, Sunset Park, big future. Don't ignore Brown Avenue. Heights and Prospect Heights. Huge the guys Prospect from the Heights. Brooklyn Fleer are opening up a very large beer hall. Yep. Um, and that whole area is transformed. Yeah. What about Crown Heights? I mean, do you see Crown, Crown Heights? Crown Heights is one of the most, probably the most amazing neighborhoods. Dynamic neighborhoods. Yes. I mean, you have the 4-5 train uh, on Eastern Parkway. Um, you have a great housing stock. Uh, you have blocks and blocks of beautiful brownstones that are Some of the not, best yeah. cultural attractions. And it's a very, city, very, York, I think Walking it's distance like, to Botanical Garden and Brooklyn And it's Museum. very much part of the authenticity of Brooklyn. It's a melting pot. So you have the young Absolutely. Midwesterners moving in. You have the locals who live there. And I, we're, we're looking and we're you know, bidding very actively on sites in Crown Heights, Prospect Heights, and that whole area. But the best area is Sheepshead Bay, right? We, just we love Sheepshead Bay. <laughs> You know, we, people, we're, people, we're along uh, Sheepshead okay, Bay. Okay, I'm biased because I grew up nearby. Sheepshead Bay was always a wonderful place. I mean, you had Lundy's, you had other things, but you, you, you had a very vibrant local, I mean, this was going back many years ago, you had a really a, a unique retail environment, okay? The bakeries were there, the, mm. the, the specialty stores were there, and then what happened was the, the retail really turned down to a different category. But Sheepshead Bay, where could you have, you, you could have the beach, you could go out on a fishing boat, sure. you know, and what you have in Manhattan Beach, you have magnificent homes in Manhattan Gorgeous. Beach and, and, you know, in Brighton Beach. Now, what happened is, you know, and I, Josh Moss and Jason are dear friends, the Oceana was bef just at the right time. It went over there. But what really didn't work is like on Ocean Parkway in Brighton Beach where somebody was trying to build over there going near the, uh, the handball courts, as we yep. would say, you know. Uh, <laughs> no, yeah. you, you know where I'm talking. Sure, I know. Uh, and, and what about our neighborhood? You know, I, I, you know, Borough Park you can't go into because it's already, every, every retail spot is sold over there. What about, uh, you know, Bay Ridge and so Bensonhurst? I look, I when, think when do we see those I, I'm a Bensonhurst boy, so, you know, and Ofer is going gonna, is gonna to help me redo Will it. Will you go to Spumoni Gardens? Go together? to Spumoni Gardens anytime. Villa Bati, though, okay. the best bakery in the world. <laughs> um, I will tell you, people forget that 
the D train express goes right to Bensonhurst. You can live in Bensonhurst, get on a D train. And you can be on your cell phone because it's up. It's, it's up. up. And be at the Good Barclays point. Center in 15 minutes. Yeah, that's remarkable. New Utrecht Avenue, uh, parts of Bensonhurst. I will tell you in the next 10 years, you're going to see artists, loft living, all of that stuff because it's cheaper than Bushwick. It's cheaper than Park Slope. And that's happening. Bay Ridge is truly become one of New York City's most uh, interesting neighborhoods. People are moving there, families, schools are great. 25% of the neighborhood is parkland, uh, incredible views. Uh, we've been, the chamber's been working very hard to get a ferry stop in Bay Ridge so that you can get Bay Ridge to downtown Brooklyn in 10, 15 minutes, a ferry stop in Sheepshead Bay as part of a Sheepshead Bay marina. I mean, the, the whole How many southern members edge. do you have in the, in the chamber? So we're, we're about to hit 1,400 members. We're, we're growing and, fast. And the type of members from? So we have real estate folks that are sitting here. We have mom and pop stores. We have utilities. We have hospitals, universities. Um, you name it, they, people want to join know, the chamber You bring up now. a very interesting point about hospitals. Right now, they, there are two closures potentially in Brooklyn. And, you know, and with more population moving to Brooklyn, you really need the hospitals or hospitals have been changed to uh, a day surgery facilities. People, hospitals, I've done a number of shows with hospital people. It's to get them out within 24 hours. So only people who are very sick go to hospitals. You right. can do day surgery. Do you see any of that growth? I mean, which has happened in Flushing. Flushing is right. over there. Mount Sinai is putting an addition right now in their Queens location. Look, I think you see it. You see it in Park Slope with Methodist. Methodist is about to undergo an incredible transformation at 300, 350,000 square feet of exactly what you said. Outpatient. You go in, you have your surgery. You relax two hours, and then you are out of there by the end of the day. And I, and I know you're right because we feel that demand in our retail properties. You know, whether it's a suburban retail property, which we own a lot of, or an urban uh, retail property, which we also own a lot of, we get a fair amount of increase from um, medical use. It's ambulatory. I, I just type wrote, of stuff. I just wrote an article specifically saying healthcare is going to the mall, and I think a great example is Forest City Rathnes property, not far from where you live, uh, in Yonkers where West Med had took 60,000 square right. feet, and West Med is open seven days a week, That's providing right. medical service. In a retail there. center. In a right. retail center, right next to, uh, <clears throat> yeah. not, not Ikea, the uh, Lego. Yeah. So you can go to Lego and uh, you know, drop the kids yeah. off over there. Yeah. <laughs> and, so. and, and retailers no longer view that as a, uh, as a, a an obnoxious use, as a co-tenant. They, they, not, not universally, but in, in many cases, they embrace that as a co-tenancy because it's a, it's a traffic driver, it's a generator. Of people coming in, they don't they don't stay for four hours anymore. They stay for an hour or so, and then they're gone. And they may happen to shop, and that's not a bad thing. Now, what about? And I I brought it up before East New York. Yep. The problem with East New York is the trains. It's it's worse than Coney Island because it's as we would the old days. Since you're older than I am, you know we call Just it by a, a little. Bit. Okay, I know. Uh, you know we call it a two fare zone. Right. I mean that that's one of the negatives perhaps of East New York, right? Look, I'll tell you this. Um, we could be talking about all the great things happening in Brooklyn, and, and I said it earlier, it's the greatest place, but until the city, the state, the feds, and us, more so the people sitting here, say we are going to do what you did in Williamsburg, what you're doing downtown, what you're doing in Fort Greene and, and around there in East New York and Brownsville and that part of Brooklyn, the story of Brooklyn can never really be at that level. You know, you know, if you want to talk about retail, East New York, where the old, the original Fortune Up was, right. on Livonia yeah. Avenue sure. and New Lots Avenue and Pitkin Avenue. Pitkin Avenue. I mean, these were, these were retail hubs. Yeah. This was, you know, Jefferson uh, High School. These were retail hubs. And, you know, it, it takes but, time. Maybe it's a little more gentrification than I, we talk about. I right think now. But I think the, the, the retailers, where, where they once, we, we, look, I started taking retailers into Brooklyn in the early 90s when Bruce Ratner was first starting to think about his first project at just off Atlantic and, and Flatbush, since built a lot more, obviously. But retailers, I remember bringing the gap down there in probably 1993 to look at what is now Atlantic Center, and there was a group of um, locals warming themselves on a bonfire. And the, the good news is the guy at the gap said, 
this is where we should put our store. Because he wasn't looking at that necessarily. He was right. looking at everything else around it. So I think that as retailers get more comfortable with their urban experience and more, more particularly their urban sales volumes, they're going to go into these areas because there's no other way to penetrate those markets here, and get here, to those here's customers. Here's the thought, and I know that they're in Staten Island, they're planning uh, the wheel, okay? And where the wheel is supposed to come up uh, over there, they're also planning a outlet center. And I think uh, Lightstone is planning an outlet center up in the White, Bronx. Whitestone uh, Cinemas. In the, the, uh, the Whitestone Cinemas. Uh, and in the same manner of what Related did in Spring Creek, which is at the end of East New York. Over Gateway. The, uh, Gateway, Spring Creek, whatever you call it. If, do you think perhaps, and this helps, you know, first of all, what, what Aqueduct is doing, it's the, it's the highest grossing casino type of business over there, you know, right. it's, it's Queens, not next to Brooklyn. Do you see perhaps if there was a retail component like an outlet center? We, we forget, but a lot of these neighborhoods were sort of transformed by gentrification organically. But a lot of these neighborhoods like Williamsburg were transformed because of very, very aggressive land use policy that was part of this administration. And let's not forget we're going through a, a new, you know, we're going into a new administration and we don't really know what. That's right what the policy would be, but I think that the voices that we hear from the community and from people that are running for office is that we want to bring Brooklyn more into these like mixed-use but, but, but communities. Here, but here's and that's something, and I'm asking Toby as a developer, part of the way that a lot of the developments took place in, in Brooklyn, even your development, were with certain tax incentives. That's okay? what I was about to add, yep. okay? yeah. Okay, they got there. Williamsburg had the 20-year, the 25-year tax mm -hmm. abatements. We don't have these 421A tax abatements anymore, and without the tax abatements, the real estate taxes that are going in I mean, if you had to pay full real estate taxes, we'd get less rent. You get less we rent. Actually, I think right. In places like Sheepside Bay and East New York and Canarsie and South Brooklyn and some parts of Central Brooklyn, we still have 421A right. as of right, which is great news. What we don't have is large parcels and, but you know, I, so I, 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 say, I think the, the, the untold story in the, in the Brooklyn boom is that through 08, 09, 10, when there really was very limited bank debt, there were hundreds of entrepreneurs who scraped together friends and family money and renovated two to ten family walk-ups and by the way and needed you that's J51 programs and so, that's what's going to happen in east new york agree. and out there well, around to michael's point i think the big challenge in the market right now which is you know a lot of focus was put on the tax abatement as it related to mega high-rise luxuries in the city but the small-time entrepreneurs without the j51 program which i think is even more critical in terms of Brooklyn's past and future, and, and I'll give you something. It's going to be which problematic. Relates even to you know we're talking that you need office space in Brooklyn. Part of the benefit is if a company moves from Manhattan to Brooklyn, they receive the REIT benefit. You know the REIT benefit was supposed to be canceled on June 30th. It was re reenacted for two more years. So this REIT benefit has to stay there. That was a state benefit, Absolutely. and it's a necessity, like ICAP. You have to create programs, and the administration did this. I mean, Bloomberg's administration did it. Well, the, the, the good news is future administrations will be able to look at the successes of the Bloomberg administration, give them credit where it's due, and they'll say, well, if we can replicate that in some degree in some of these other challenged markets, we should reap the benefits as well. It's there to be exactly. seen. So when we begin the 13th season in September, Hopefully, I'll have my Brooklyn advocates back, and we'll talk again on that. I'd like to thank uh, Ofer, Toby, Chris, and Carlo. And thank you, and I'll see you next week. Thank you. Very good.